Everybody in their places with bright shining faces. Good evening. On behalf of the uh, Avenue of Virginia uh, Town Council, I would like to welcome everyone to our uh, May 6, 19, uh, 2013 uh, meeting. I'm almost in the wrong century here. Um, and again, on behalf of the council, we welcome everyone tonight. Uh, there's a couple of things that I would uh, point out, one of which is uh, that uh, prior to each meeting, our council members received a package of uh, uh, materials that uh, give us background information and help us to address the issues that we'll be considering. Copies of that material are on the table over to my left. And uh, if you wish to look at those materials, uh, you know, please feel free to do so and share it with others. Another point that is not on the agenda that I'm always the one who is most guilty of uh, is to remind everybody that there is a need, please, to turn off your cell phones. And some of us have more than one phone. And, uh, so if we could do that uh, before we get started, I would sincerely appreciate it. And uh, that being said, I will ask our clerk, Ms. Cecile Rosenbaum, to call the roll, please. Uh, Mr. Howard. Here. Let's see, Mr. Humphreys. Here. Mr. Barry. Here. Mayor Morgan. Here. Let the record reflect that four council members are present and Mrs. Lowe is absent tonight. And we would note that there's always a possibility that uh, even though uh, Vice Mayor Lowe is uh, involved in a uh, uh, intense education program to prepare her for the CPA exam. There's at least a chance that she is watching us live tonight uh, out there, and if she doesn't watch us tonight, she may catch us up on the, uh, the town's website in a day or two. So we wave and uh, wish you all the luck in the world and hope everything goes well on that. Uh, we have several folks in uniform here tonight, in addition to the police uh, department representatives who are often here. Uh, Mr. Richard McBeth has brought a couple of uh, scouts who are working on their citizenship in the community uh, merit badge. I've already, already explained to these fellows how that is the merit badge that is most important in the citizenship uh, department because local government is the, the level that has the, the most impact on our daily lives. We are pleased to have uh, Joey and Sammy uh, Bauer, uh, excuse me, I'm going to mispronounce it, uh, Brozerman uh, with us this evening. And uh, we thank you for your interest in uh, coming out and observing how we make the sausage, as they say in government. Uh, and we'd also like to have this opportunity for you to come forward and lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. And if you'll do that at this time, I would appreciate it. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, and I, 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 oh, excuse me. The fellas, uh, if you come back here, we have a couple of things to help uh, mark the occasion. Thank you, Council, for reminding me. You know, uh, we have for each of you the uh, highly coveted uh, town of Abingdon uh, health care. You know, and Mr. Mr. Macbeth, you yeah, have one. Oh. <laughs> 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 yeah. Thank you, and it's uh, it's high time that all three of you have one of these things. And I would point out for the record that I think. Uh, uh, Councilman Barry and I are both proud to have Eagle Scout uh, as one of the things on our resume. And, uh, you know, we, we wish you good luck in your scouting program. Uh, now we have special employee, resi uh, uh, special employee presentations, uh, recognition of service. And I'll turn that over to Mr. Kelly, if he'll take, it through us, take us through it, please. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, if you don't mind, I'm going to step down for a minute. <laughs> um, good evening, everyone. It's always a great opportunity when I get to stand up here and express my gratitude and thanks to some of the town employees and staff uh, for the things that they do. And tonight we have two employees that I'd like to recognize in terms of longevity awards for being here employed by the town of Abingdon. And the first is uh, James M. Cowart. And Jim, I'd like for you to come up. Um, Jim has been our Director of Economic Development and Grant Writer for the past five years. And he's done an excellent job trying to find us uh, some money. And, and in today's economic time, we need all the help we can get in terms of 
increasing our revenue. So I'm very grateful for what you do in that regard. Relative to economic development, I don't think that you find anybody who loves the town as, uh, quite as much as Jim does and goes the extra mile to try to keep us on the growing path within the town. So you've done, you've done a, a good job in your commitment for the town to have it. So tonight I'd like to present you with your five-year award from Inwood Town. I hope the time has flown by. Yeah. <laughs> Next, I'd like to uh, call upon Camille Finney, who's with the Town of Avenue Police Department, come forward. And Camille has uh, been with the police department now for 15 long years. I'm glad you said that I was going to. <laughs> I also point out that Camille holds the rank of sergeant, and she does a tremendous <coughs> job. You always see her out and about. Um, <coughs> overseeing the uh, patrol operations that, that are under her and I want to thank you for your support and your leadership and your commitment to the town of Abingdon. I'd like to present you with your 15-year plaque and 15-year pen, but I want to tell you that we misspelled your name wrong. On the <laughs> <laughs> but we're going, we're going to get that corrected, so I'm going to go ahead and present it to you and then I'm going to take it back. <laughs> Thank you for all you've done for the community. Thank you. She was good. No, she wasn't. Okay, yes, sir. And Miss. It's a three. You're missing the nail. We have uh, one other individual who's not listed on the agenda tonight that I would like to. Uh, Highly commend, and and that's our town clerk, Cecile Rosenbaum. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, Cecile's been here for forty years. <laughs> it feels like four hundred you know, years. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just I'm just teasing, but I do want to commend her because Cecile just obtained her Master Municipal Clerk certification from. Uh, the International Municipal Clerks Association and she's one of about three and one of those I believe is retiring who is from Southwest Virginia and this is a very high um, uh, um, certification for anybody in the clerks field to to receive and it's taken her about six or seven years of hard work wow. and continued <laughs> education to to uh, get this certification and I'm also going to put point out to you that she was recently elected vice president of the Virginia State Clerks Association and next year she will be president of that All right. We don't have a plaque. We don't have a plaque for her, but she did receive her nice uh, certificate, which is in the process, I believe, of being framed. And she's also sporting a nice uh, MMC pin that has a diamond in it, I think. Yeah. Yes, and I must tell you all that when this came in, um, I was struggling to get my little plaque out of the box that it came in from California. And Greg reached over on my desk, and there was this little water brown paper, and he said, here, you're about to throw this away. It's got something in it. 
So I looked, and it was my little pen. And he grabbed the pen out, and he said, it's got a diamond in it. And it says, member of the fraternal order of the moose. <laughs> Thankfully, he was wrong. It does not say that. <laughs> but um, thank you very much for your comments. And um, I can't do any of this without the support of the folks that I work with and the town council members. And my town manager is a really great guy. And the town attorney is my support. And Kim Kingsley is the best thing that ever happened to the third floor of the town hall. <laughs> and um, this is a really great council, too. Everybody's so supportive and, and willing to work with me. And I'm also trying to raise a 16-year-old. So um, this is a great place to work. And I value my job very much. Well, we thank you very much for your service, and it's a wonderful thing to see, you know, all of our employees. And uh, I have to say that we've uh, we've had a number of our employees who have tried very hard to educate themselves and be, you know, reach the top levels of uh, their profession. And uh, you know, it's certainly a real credit to you and the town and uh, and the uh, and the manager and the council too that you've uh, chosen to go ahead and uh, uh, and obtain that certification. And thank you very much for thank doing you. it. You know. We do appreciate that. Uh, is there any other recognition that will be noted? Uh, uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. I, I have uh, one if, we, if I could. Oh, uh, feel free. Okay. Well, as, as the unofficial Toastmaster of, uh, of Abingdon, uh, every now and then we have birthdays that uh, land on <laughs> council night. And tonight we have two birthdays. Yeah, yeah. And I would like for you all to join with me in singing happy birthday <laughs> to Town Attorney Deb Eisenhower and Director of Tourism Kevin Costello. So if y'all rise and sing, please. <laughs> Thank you for choosing to spend your birthday with us here tonight, <laughs> as opposed to the other options you might have had available. All right, we, we do, uh, it's a pleasure to acknowledge all of these things this evening, and uh, I believe, does anybody else have any recognitions that we need to make? Okay, hearing none, we will move on here. And that brings us to something a little less fun, and that is the approval of minutes. I have for our consideration three sets of minutes. First of all, the April 1st, 2013 work session meeting, the regular meeting uh, minutes of that same evening, and also the uh, work session meeting that was held on April 17th, 2013. Are there any corrections or additions that need to be noted to uh, uh, those minutes? Hearing none, I will uh, uh, entertain a motion. I'm going to make a motion that we'll go ahead and approve all three sets of the minutes. I second. Okay, we have a motion and second. Any comments? Hearing none, Ms. Rosenbaum, if you call the roll, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Aye. Mr. Baird. Aye. And Mayor Morgan. Aye. Thank you very much. Uh, we have several public hearings that are going to be held this evening, and the first one is for an ordinance of the Council of the Town of Abingdon, Virginia, to repeal, amend, and reenact Part 2, Chapter 14, Buildings and Building Regulations, Article 1, 14, 1 through uh, 1457 of the Code of the Ordinances of the Town of Abingdon, Virginia. Uh, Ms. Deb Eisenhower and uh, Mr. S and Officer C.J. McLaughlin have both worked very long and hard to bring us to this uh, uh, point in time where we can have more effective uh, and uh, updated regulations for our consideration. And I'll ask you folks to take us through the general idea of what we will, uh, first of all, entertain comments on during the public hearing and perhaps act on after that. Honorable Mayor and Councilman, um, this evening's proposed ordinance amendment is to repeal the Mandy Man Act Part 2, Chapter 14, Buildings and Building Regulations, Article 1 of the Code of Ordinances for the Town of Abingdon's. Uh, the most explicitly um, changes the, and incorporates the most recent addition of the Virginia Maintenance Code so that we can update language in certain sections contained within our ordinance and create a more accurate ordinance which reflects current policies and services. And um, we find this to be in the correct order and we'll let Officer McLaughlin answer any and all questions. 
Uh, if you would give us a, a brief idea, and again, brief would be fine, okay. of uh, you know uh, what sort of changes uh, will be noted and why we needed this. Hey, uh, as everybody very well does, the police department took over code enforcement in July of 2012, and that December mark, and there marked our six-month uh, anniversary of doing everything. And we, we took a step back and said, how can we do this better And as, as far as the police department? And we went to other localities and said, how are you guys doing? And then pretty much everybody said, you need to adopt the maintenance code if you haven't already done that. Um, so uh, we learned about what that took and what was had to go about that. We have gone and taken the three classes required to uh, enforce the code. We just have one more. Uh, I have an exam to take, a certification exam. And after that, we're ready to go. The, so pretty much right now, we're ready to uh, jump off the cliff and, and adopt the code and, and move forward. Right. It would be the recommendation of, of the legal department to approve this amendment on first reading. Okay. Very good. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, and uh, don't go too far away. Okay. Okay. That being said, uh, again, we have uh, uh, we're going to have a public hearing uh, concerning the uh, uh, proposed enactment, the enactment of the amendments to the uh, ordinance that have been described. Uh, is there? I will at this time declare the public hearing to be open. If there is anyone present who wishes to address the town council regarding this specific matter, they are welcome to come forward and, uh, and speak to us at the present time. And again, if there is anyone that wishes to talk about this matter, they are welcome to do so at the present time. There does not appear to be anyone who wishes to address the council. Do, do you wish to talk about this, ma'am? Okay, come forward, please. Uh, I want to thank Ms. Eisenhower for speaking with me about this matter and for you all allowing me time okay, to speak. Ma'am, I, I would ask you for the record if you in, would uh, identify yourself. Oh, I'm sorry. State your name and address, please. I'm new at this. <laughs> okay, my name is fine. Patricia Haley, and I live at 231 Henderson Court. Okay. And one of the reasons that I'm here to address this issue is I recently spoke with Ms. Eisenhower and also Officer McLaughlin when they were checking out a residence that is directly behind me. Now, I've lived at Henderson Court for approximately three and a half years. And this code, one of the reasons they're looking at it is this house that is behind us. And all of us in the neighborhood are very concerned about this. I'm very glad they're taking steps to get, get it up to code. Okay? I think that's important. But what we're concerned about is what happens next. If that house, it has a long-standing history of a lot of problems. And if it's just meet, meets minimum codes or whatever just to get it up to code, and the owner who now has it, I think, wants to run it again, we're possibly going to have the same deterioration and the same problems that we've had before. And if you would allow me, I would like to just address a few of those that we've seen. Because I think this is not a one-dimensional problem. I think it involves a neighborhood. And I understand the importance of property values I've owned and sold a home. I understand the quality of a neighborhood. And I see that all of our neighbors have kept their properties up. The sidewalks that you all have put in and everything, the upgrades, it is really going to benefit an enhancement to our neighborhood. But unfortunately, this house that is behind us is a blight and not just its physical being. Mm -hmm. the, the, there have been many tenants who've lived in there who were transient. Uh, there was trash that constantly littered that alleyway. I have seen people who have turned the alleyway into a public toilet, literally. Some of the younger ones that lived in there would trespass on the property, on my property. I cannot count the times I've had to collect beer bottles, all kinds of trash that comes over into my house, into some of our others. <laughs> you know, I want to see a long-term solution to this for the whole neighborhood, and I'm just afraid that if that house is not rented to different or tenants that are more willing, there has been to me no oversight, no anything. I mean, there have been people in there that, well, like I said, I've picked up beer bottles. The younger ones that were in there, you would try to speak to them. They were not only belligerent, they were profane. Um, and I am very grateful for our police force showing up when they needed to be. 
But one of the comments that was made was, thank goodness no more police cars, because there was poli repeatedly police officers. And it is very disturbing. And um, oh, also, at one point, I believe there was a rapist that lived in there. Now, I am a woman, I am a senior, and I reside alone. I'm not really thrilled about having to to know that there may be, and actually I'd even like to know if there is one. I didn't, you know, we weren't notified or anything. It's just these things that you hear. I want to see our neighborhood kept up. I want to see the quality of it kept up. And unfortunately, if it's, that house is not brought up to what it really should be, because there was just a conglomerate of transient tenants in there with all kinds of issues. There was one gentleman in there that apparently would get drunk regularly, or he may have been off medications, I don't know, and would just run around the property, banging on doors. That's disturbing. And um, these are our concerns. And I just, I came tonight, and I thank you for the time, because we're talking about a neighborhood here. And we're talking about property values and the quality of our neighborhood, our safety and health, from what I understand, that place was quite infested. That's another issue. It's going to take a lot to get that house up beyond minimum code standards, I think. And this is what we're looking at. So here I am. I just wanted to tell you all and hope that that will be taken into consideration when this is looked at. I want to thank you for coming. Uh, for somebody who's not done this before, I think you've done very nicely. And <laughs> that noise you hear is my beans knocking. <laughs> you, you've done fine, and we're not a, we're not a terribly intimidating uh, group. Uh, 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 but we love you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we even vote. Well, I, awesome. I would like to say that, uh, and I'm, um, we'll have a further discussion about this after we close out the uh, hearing, but. Uh, council has been briefed by Officer McLaughlin uh, extensively about this. Uh, you know, it was pointed out to us and made very clear to us that uh, we needed to have additional, uh, you know, legal tools in our arsenal, so to speak, to address the kinds of problems yeah. that you're, you're addressing. Well, that's yeah. what we've been concerned yeah. with, that it would be looked at as just getting this building up to code, and it's going to take so much. But we just felt that there was, you know, so much more involved here. And I do thank you for your time and for listening. Well, we, we thank you for, you know, your interest in coming it out. It matters. It, yeah, it does. And it's one of those things where when you have this sort of uh, constant concern and irritation, it really right. affects people's quality of life, their health, many other things. Economics, everything. It values. does. The value of your property. You know, we are aware of that. And, again, we certainly are aware that there are problems that we're trying to uh, uh, effectively address them. And this is one of the tools that was critical in terms of being Just able to do that in the future. Does anyone have any, any uh, questions of uh, uh, Ms. Holly? Uh, Haley. Haley, excuse me. That's uh, okay. While she's here. Right. Thank you very much. We okay, appreciate thank you. coming out. Okay. Is there anyone else present tonight who wishes to address the council on this matter? Okay. Since there does not appear to be anyone else present this evening who wishes to address the council on the, uh, this matter, uh, I will declare the public hearing to be uh, closed. Uh, council, our, uh, we have this matter now for our consideration, uh, again, the enactment of uh, this particular ordinance. Uh, we have a recommendation from our staff that, uh, uh, you know, that we uh, again enact it perhaps on the first reading, which would enable it to go to, into effect within, I believe, a 30-day period of the time it's first enacted. Is there uh, any discussion about this matter? Yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, and when we discussed this with uh, with uh, Officer McLaughlin downstairs, uh, it was my my recollection that we had said that we because it does deal with private property owners that we would do we would want a two uh, two readings on this. Uh, I think that was the consensus downstairs when we were doing this because it did uh, uh, concern the private, private property owners. Okay. I mean, I'm not saying that that's what you need to do. I'm just saying that was what we had touched yeah, about that. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, it was, a, uh, in effect, a major sort of um, uh, change here. Uh, again, we have, the, uh, we have those 
that option, or we have several options available. Is there other discussion, or would someone care to make a motion regarding this matter at the present time? Mr. Mayor, I, yes, I would point out that if um, if council elects to go to the second reading, I don't believe any formal action is actually necessary at this reading. I know sometimes from time to time we actually make the motion to enact on the first reading and then we go ahead and have the second reading, but the formal inaction would come at the end of the second reading. Okay. So if we chose to um, have uh, a second reading, in other words, what we have done tonight would be considered the first reading. That's correct. And if we had the second one, that would be in June, and at that time we would be, um, uh, we would make a, uh, a recommendation. So our options are tonight to take no action and allow it to come up again on the, in July when we could enact it if we so choose, or we could uh, have a motion to enact it tonight and um, and uh, dispense. dispense with the second That's reading. That's correct. You said July, June. June, excuse me. Uh, you know, it's a little further out there. Okay, uh, Council, is, uh, does anyone care to make a motion about this matter this evening? Okay. I, I think what I'm hearing is that there is a consensus that there is a serious interest in this particular motion. Uh, or this uh, topic and that we would uh, have it on the uh, June agenda for action at that time uh, when we would have a second reading. Right. I, I don't think there's any doubt that we all probably want to, to yeah. muster this along. It's just a matter of uh, being sure that we can hear from all of, all of our constituents to make sure that they are in approval also. Okay. Any further comments about this matter? Okay. It will be on the uh, June uh, uh, agenda. Okay. And thank you uh, very much. Okay, our second public hearing tonight is on the first reading an ordinance of the Council of the Town of Avenue, Virginia, proposing to sell and grant a franchise for an electric power transmission and distribution system in the Town of Avenue, Virginia, and, it, and inviting bids there, uh, therefore. And Ms. Eisenhower will take this uh, through this, and I believe Ms. Mary uh, Begley, uh, Manager for External Affairs from uh, Appalachia Power, is with us uh, this evening. I must admit, I had several people call me about this and was wondering, you know, what uh, companies were proposing to uh, <laughs> offer electrical service in the town. And if uh, Ms. Eisenhower, if you will introduce this uh, to us, please, and then we'll have the public hearing and there will be discussion. I think we can take care of your inquiries. Pursuant to the Code of Virginia 15.2-2100 and 2101, the fact that the town's most recent electrical franchise expires on June 26, 2013, and the towns that brings the town's electrical franchise in need of renewal. Um, pursuant to the same codes, the advertisement inviting the bids has been properly placed and run for the requisite amount of time in the newspaper of general circulation in our town. And with that said, I'd like to, well, before, before I say that, Appalachian Power Company has responded and the town has received its bid accordingly. And with that said, I'd like to reintroduce you uh, to Ms. Mary Bagley. question, were there any other bids? No, there were not. Oh, okay. Anyway, Ms. Bagley will explain that one to you, but no, Appalachian Power is, is the only approved company for such. Ms. Mary Bagley? Okay. With Appalachian Power, we'll sing and dance. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Eisenhower. And welcome, Council Members. It's really great to be with you this evening, and it's good to have an opportunity to speak with you. As Ms. Eisenhower mentioned, I am here, she introduced, I'm here today uh, seeking renewal of the franchise agreement between the Town of Addington and Appalachian Power Company. And hopefully I can answer those questions that, that you may have received. Um, I guess I can summarize to begin with that the franchise, in summary, is an agreement or a covenant between a town and a utility that allows for convenient and efficient delivery of electric service to the citizens of that town. And that's including construction and um, maintenance. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Well, I'm just trying to, um, I'll tell you what, I want to have the public hearing. Uh, we will do that, and then there will be questions. Certainly. 
Okay. Uh, again, uh, we uh, have for our consideration this evening an ordinance to propose and sell a grant of a franchise for the electric power transmission and distribution in the town of Abingdon, Virginia. We do have one bidder so far for, uh, you know, for this. And uh, at the present time, uh, we will have the public hearing. I will declare the public hearing to be open. And if there is anyone present who wishes to address the council regarding this proposed franchise arrangement with Appalachian Power Company, which you might know we are required by law to, uh, you know, to grant the franchise and to have the public hearing, uh, but they are welcome to come forward at the present time. I see Mr. Macbeth uh, with us this evening. To yeah, Richard Macbeth, 1139 Panorama Drive in Abington. Uh, the questions I have basically is what what changes is that going to be to our uh, cost factor? Is this going to raise our rates? Uh, are we going to stay the same type of rates? Or are they going to go down? I seriously doubt they're going to go down. Um, it would be nice if they go down. But the other other thing I would like to bring up also is, is the possibility of maybe also putting up um, gas capabilities in the uh, community like we have a started up in uh, in uh, South U area. I like to see it go completely all the way up to the top of the hill. So we have some competitors. Right now we're we're strictly electric up where we're at. And we would love to be able to have the other options of the other utilities uh, to help with our heating and, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things like that. So that's the other thing I wanted to talk about okay. on that. But uh, I don't know where we're standing with this. With only one bidder it's not a very <laughs> well, it's like it's like it's like a monopoly. Well, it is uh, in, I know. in its own way, and uh, you know, basically, the st uh, the state of Virginia uh, offers uh, you know the service area or the franchise out, and then we in, in turn get to award it. Uh, and you know, there are real limits in terms of what we're able to do about this. I would note that uh, you know there is a I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, a separate franchise for the. A provision of natural gas services in the town that would be handled by the Atmos company, right. and that uh, you know Appalachian Power is basically in the electricity oh, business. I that's, but the thing um, is, is but I don't see a lot of that going to that. Um, I don't see anything <coughs> in marketing for Atmos. I don't see anything. Uh, I know they came in and redid all the pipes for uh, JMH come through our area, uh -huh. and we have it for the first two streets, but we don't. They just don't come all the way up. And, I like to see some kind of competition there, because right now they're the only game in the house. Yeah, they are. And um, in a, I don't know where we stand with with the council on that. Is uh, what kind of input do they have on other utilities going up there? Well, I, I think it's uh, we ought to have a discussion with Atmos about that, and mm -hmm. uh, you know uh, I think some of the questions that will come up tonight will deal with. Uh, uh, service and safety and so forth and I think that's probably a question that we need to have with anyone who provides that kind of franchise within the yeah. town and uh, again the you know the fact that uh, the service is available in only certain neighborhoods I think is uh, is something that uh, merits discussion oh, yeah, most definitely very, very okay. good sir but I like okay. to see where where the yeah. rates are going to go and we'll that's give her an opportunity to respond right, to that you. here in a, in a minute uh, is there anyone else who wishes to uh, uh, you know, address the council regarding this matter. Okay, there does not appear to be anyone else who wishes to address the uh, uh, the council at the present time regarding this topic. Uh, therefore, I will declare the public hearing to be closed, and I will uh, invite Ms. Begley to come back uh, forward and join us. I know that there will be some questions here, and perhaps you might even comment. Uh, first of all, about the question that Mr. McBeth raised, uh, you know, regarding where rates are going to be going in the future. Absolutely. Um, uh, rates continue to be a concern of customers and uh, for us as well. We understand that in the past now, seven, eight years or so, that um, as you know, that we have faced rate increases. Of course, that is due to the cost of the fuel that we use. Uh, in addition to that, the cost to use that fuel. We were predominantly 95% or so plus coal-fired 
uh, around the year of 2005. And of course, I'll, I'm, I can't stand before you myself and tell you all, you all know, you've read everything that's happened with the market. And, and of course, with EPA regulations, we have had to uh, scrub plants to uh, the cost of around, well, in excess of $2 billion. Scrubbing the plants actually uh, costs more than those plants did when we built those years ago. Um, in terms of a rate, a rate is just it's a snapshot in time, and rates do fluctuate from time to time. <laughs> Let me just in mentioning fuel alone, in 2009, just to give you an example if, if you'd like, in 2009, we had a 10% rate increase in fuel cost in August of that year. 2010, a 10% decrease that same decrease. So, so rates do go down. Um, that year in 2009, what had gone up in nine went back down in 10. Uh, 11 was, uh, it was flat last summer. And in, in the midst of the summer, we had a 7% increase in fuel. That's an annual review, and we'll know where that's going later in the year. But those do change from time to time. This year, we've had a 3% decrease. So those, as I'm, I'm saying, those rates do go up and down. They fluctuate based on cost. Rates, our rates are established by the State Corporation Commission. As you all know, they're not a, a random choice. The, the State Corporation Commission reviews our information. We present a case, and, and they leave no stone unturned. They go to Ohio, examine our books, and they make sure that any costs that we incur are just and prudent. Um, an electric utility, the way our rates are developed, we incur the cost, and then we seek recovery of those costs. So it is a, it's, it's a very lengthy, very complicated process, but, but in a nutshell, that is how it, how it works. Um, hopefully, and I can, if you'd like, I could talk just a little bit more about hope. We're hoping that uh, rates have stabilized and there will be some up and down movement from time to time. Hopefully it won't be great. We're in the midst at this time of an asset transfer case. I don't you may have heard that of some of that we have um, asked the commission to consider and hopefully we'll receive a positive ruling later in the summer of transferring parts, major parts of two already scrubbed power plants. That would be Appalachian power assets and we're hoping to be able to do that for little, if any, rate impact. So again, we're hoping that uh, for the next number of years we're, we're reaching some sort of stability. Again, we'll, we'll have these minor fluctuations up and down. Which but assets are you referring to? Uh, that's the anus and mutual plants. And I do bring some material for you if you'd like for me to share it with you in regard to those. I also have material on, on rates, rate comparisons for the state, if you'd like those as well. Uh, may I approach? Yes, please. The importance of this, this asset transfer, as you'll see in the document, the multicolor document, is that Appalachian Power is a capacity deficit, deficit company. And I, I know this is, it's a little outside of the, the franchise agreement, but I, I think it may help in, in everyone understanding where we are at this point. But if you'll see, this little table here in the upper right hand corner, we are, are deficit. We do not produce enough electricity to cover all the requirements of our customers. So what have we done through the years? We have purchased electricity from the AEP pool. Um, at this point in time, it's a, you know, they've been in that pool, that electricity in that pool has been impacted by the same increases in cost of fuel, cost to use that fuel. 
And at the same time, we find that in Ohio Power, you, were, you have AEP, the parent, and then you have the operating companies. AEP Ohio Power is a sister company. Uh, so restructuring is occurring in Ohio, and the generation assets of that company have been made available for transfer. The FERC ruling just came down last week that has uh, approved the transfer of those assets. We're hoping to move parts of Amos and Mitchell to, to Appalachian Power, to our books. And basically what it does, it moves us from being a renter, because we've already been buying electricity from those plants. And it moves us from being a renter to an owner. And again, it gets back to the question regarding rates. That will, uh, that will help to stabilize rates. Council, do we have questions, Ms. Bagley? Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, I've got some comments and questions. And uh, Ms. Bagley and I had a chance to talk last week for about 30 minutes after the chamber lunch, so we've had some of this discussion. But I think it's good for the for the council and for the audience out here. Uh, I share, like Mr. McBeth, uh, concern for rates. Um, I moved back to Abbey then seven years ago, and every year the rates pretty much have gone up. And I've got a copy of your annual report, this year's 2012 annual report. And if this is correct, uh, 2010, 2011, rate increases for APCO, that's us here, $63 million by the State Corporation Commission. 11, 12, $87 million rate increases by the State Corporation Commission. And 12, 13, current year, $117 million. So in three years, it's $267 million in rate increases approved by the State Corporation Commission. And that's from their annual report. So. The reality is, I'm not sure the percentages, but the dollars, I mean, are adding up, and I understand most of that's probably fuel, but I'm getting to my long-winded question. Um, I have a little concern about the transfer. I know it doesn't really matter for this tonight necessarily, but I think long-term it could, and I think it, it could impact, in my opinion, the rates. And let me just read. One little blurb here. The AEP East Companies has asked the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission to terminate the existing interconnection agreement and approve a power cooperation agreement among APCO, Indiana and Michigan, and Kentucky power companies um, to supply the power resources. Under this power coordination agreement, all those power companies would be individually responsible for planning their respective capacity obligations, which you alluded to, and there would be no capacity equalization charges or credits on deficits or surpluses among the companies. Um, later on in the report, further on, it talks about the, the net asset transfer and how it's currently working with Ohio Power is it's, it's a shared pool process. The way I understand this, it's kind of deregulating that through the, the, the transfer of these assets. Um, and along with that, it's asking that if this is approved by the uh, State Corporation Commission, there would be an, a request for a rate increase. So the way I see current activities, and I guess you'd say changing the business model, is there's going to be at least another request, and I think it came public last week, for an additional rate increase for, um, for APCO. Um, my question, I know it's long-winded, but my question is, as you look at going from a shared pool current Ohio power situation to buying or transferring these assets, and it's not a total transfer. They're not 100% transferred. It's two-thirds and one-half in the two different plants. Is going forward, is this a model that will stabilize rates, or as you leave a shared pool scenario, you're actually creating an environment where customers are going to have to pay more because you can't benefit from sharing, as this alluded to. There would be no equalization of charges or credits on a deficit or a surplus. So, I mean, I studied economics a long time ago, and I'm not sure it makes sense from my point of view and my read as a customer and other customers' AEP. But my big question with all that is, how is it going to affect rates? Has the company done an analysis of this change in the business plan? And, you know, can you tell us going forward this is going to be a good thing for customers and people in their community or could it be a bad thing? I don't know. Well, you pick up a lot of points in that and um, the shared pool has served us very well. 
through the years. But as I said before, that pool has faced the same increases in cost that we have faced here with our generation because of of the cost of fuel and the cost to use the f the pool with um, you know with re EPA regulations that have have come from DC. The commissions have began to not like the equalization charges. That's been something, you're talking about something there that, um, that there's been pushback on that because it's paying another company for generation that, that they are producing. This move will enable us to have our own generation. Again, I, I refer back to on the right hand, the upper right hand table. Um, this shows you about those two plants without the Anderson Mitchell plants where we would be in capacity. You see the, the line right here indicates our the capacity requirements. We're deficit. That means that we would still continue to have to purchase electricity somewhere else, either from the pool or the market. Our analysis has shown that the least cost to customer would be to purchase these, and you can see down lower down here that we're at $702 a KW. Can we build for that? We can't build for that. Um, the, the closest for, for building new generation would be new natural gas at 1250 per KW. Um, a coal, supercritical coal plant runs about four times that amount. So it's our determination that this is the least cost to bring generation to, to fill that capacity, that need for capacity. Another item, you know, if we go to market to buy them, and, and again, this pool is being changed, so we're in the open market buying, there would be volatility that could be harmful to rate payers there. Um, we feel that the addition of, of this capacity, this generation capacity, is the most stable. Now, one other, uh, another aspect is, could we get it through energy efficiency programs? Well, there's a, a note down on the bottom of the page there that explains that we, at some point, will have energy efficiency programs here in Virginia. We do have a program in West Virginia. And the savings, a lot of kilowatt hours were saved in 2012, 51 million kilowatt hours. But that's enough, that's only enough to provide energy, electricity, to about half of 1% of our total customer base. So the analysis has been done by us as, as a corporation. This is our proposal. Um, FERC has agreed that they have approved the asset transfer from Ohio Power to the operating companies. And at this point, it's up to the State Corporation Commission and the Public Service Commission to do their review. And uh, again, as I said earlier, I, I can assure you it will be an in-depth review to make sure that it is the best option for our rate payers. One follow-on question. When will the State Corporation Commission do that review? It should be later in the year. Later the, the, year. Hearing, the, pub, the, uh, the hearing was Tuesday or Wednesday of last, last week. Last week? Yes. The public the 30th. Hearing. The 30th. Okay. Uh, Mr. Howard, uh, do you have a question? You well, it doesn't really reflect what we're talking about right now, but we can, I can ask that later. Uh, this is an opportunity. <laughs> we don't ask it. You know, we don't, uh, uh, about every five years, we get an opportunity to have this conversation. I think it's fine. This is, and I'm, I don't have a lot of information on this yet, but I understand that, that AEP is looking for a location for a network operation control center somewhere in southwest Virginia. Is that correct? Are you for, for a the network right? operation? That's what I was told and heard that Salem and Withel are being considered. Oh, are we, are we, would we still be involved? We would like to do what we can to bring that center here if possible. If that's a very good question. Um, that's regarding economic development. It actually is not, it, well, it's not AEP. Uh, again, I'm... I put you on the spot. No, 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 no. It's just, it's outside. I know you have a lot of questions, and I, I as long as you... Yeah, I know what we're referring to now. Um, it's not an AEP operating center, or any, any, it's not an AEP or an APCO facility. Basically what it is, is a number of years ago, um, a strategic decision was made that, Apple, that AEP would no longer participate in economic development. And one of the things we've heard through, I guess some people refer to it as the 2000 alts, 
from communities, from councils such as yours, um, from county governments, from state governments, is they wanted they wanted to see us back in in that, those programs. So within the past year, year and a half or so, the decision was made to jump back into that and bring back professionals who are very good in in those programs, who be, who have good contacts and who are able to bring in um, prospects. Basically what that was, a, an outside party, a, a third party, looked at facilities across the AEP system and they have certified those two locations that you mentioned as being uh, their certified uh, network or certified data center locations. Those will not be the only, I'm sure there will be additional added to this as time goes by, but at this point those two have been certified so far. So hopefully we'll be able to get some more. It has to do with everything across the board. It's looking for a site that is ready to bring the data center in. Very good question. It certainly sounds like our business and technology park. You know, uh, be a a very good I can think of some properties over there that are in that neighborhood at least that are equipped with fiber optics and the latest technology, you know, uh, and, uh, and and that are not currently pledged to our, our medical school, too. Well, um, perhaps I, you know, maybe I could bring our economic development person by. Really pleased to see Really pleased. I'm sorry I didn't have more information no, that, starting out, but uh, that's just Yeah, at, really, at first I thought, well, what are we looking for? But no, that, that was it. <laughs> Gary, I'd be, I'd be happy to talk to you at a later mm -hmm. point okay. about, okay. about that and about the possibilities that we might have here now. Okay. Uh, Mr. Okay. Roberts. Yeah, hold your hearts. I don't have a thing to ask. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I would ask a, a question of Mr. Kelly uh, while we're on the topic, and uh, hopefully this is no longer an issue. But in the past, we've had a contractual arrangement with Appalachian Power uh, in regard to our uh, street lights and so forth and uh, at least in the past there have been some occasional difficulties uh, with that. Uh, things in good shape at this point? Uh, we, we've we been uh, working on, on that and I've had discussions with Mary and we've got a mechanism in place with the town staff to report the um, street light outages uh, to them and um, they they have been responding to to those requests as as we have sent sent them out. They obviously can't get to them immediately, oftentimes. But um, nonetheless, I would have to say, Mr. Mayor, that it has improved. And um, if if I might also comment a little bit more about other maintenance mm -hmm. issues, um, the town staff and I. Uh, several of the town staff and I had occasion to uh, visit Mary's Operations Center in Glade Spring and talk to some of the key high up um, uh, staff members there about um, how storm outages are, are um, managed and also how maintenance issues are, are managed. And I believe Mary's even offered to come to a work session at some point in time and point out some of those things to the council. But I do have to say that I, I didn't have a full grasp on exactly what's involved with a storm outage, but they have a state-of-the-art state system up there to where they can uh, track, track those outages and try to get people back online as as quickly as possible and, and one of the things we talked about that we could possibly improve upon is uh, Appalachian Power and the town developing a better method of getting information out to the public when there is an outage of when to expect that it would be put back um, in service so I, I think I speak for all the staff that went with me uh, to that meeting, we were quite impressed by their system of operations and how they track things, and they can actually see trucks on site and, and exactly what what is going on on a minute by minute um, basis. Um, I, I would also point out, relative to the franchise agreement, that um, it it does have a um, every five years the ability for either party to um, terminate. The agreement so if the service areas were to expand for other companies and, and you know we started talking about pricing and and that came into play there is that there is that mechanism that's built in in there um, 
uh, on this end of the state, just from looking at the maps, you can tell that uh, pretty much Appalachian Power Company um, uh, dominates. Uh, there's a few sections in South, Southwest Virginia, I believe, where PVU through TVA has a little uh, window of uh, service that doesn't stretch to us, and then Dominion Power with their plant has uh, got a certain small window of Southwest Virginia, I believe. But um, I think um, overall we have the capability in the event that um, area service areas expand to to um, uh, look look at this franchise agreement every five years if necessary. Very good. And I will ask uh, one question. Uh, um, I know that our focus has to be on, uh, you know, the franchise of delivering services uh, into the town of Abingdon. That's really what we're considering uh, tonight. But I noticed that you had something regarding uh, line maintenance, a new four-year plan and so forth, and uh, the, of vegetation management and so forth. And, and I will have to say that uh, Mr. Sigmund, who has at least some uh, connection with Appalachian Power, has done much <laughs> that that? <laughs> and having been to encourage power line compatible trees, which we realize is a part of the solution of the problem. Uh, but I will have to say that I've had concerns uh, about the number of power outages, uh, not just in the town of Abingdon, but in all over southwestern Virginia, and the impact it has on people's lives when, uh, you know, you might have a town uh, or a place like Castlewood or St. Paul that might go a week without uh, power. And it raised questions in my mind, uh, you know, uh, regarding the uh, company's uh, uh, line maintenance or uh, the maintenance schedule of the uh, right-of-ways and so forth and uh, whether the company was putting as much proportionately into that effort as they have in, uh, in previous years, because I, I uh, and uh, my br uh, bread and butter job, I deal with the consequences of people being out of power, and it makes a terrible, terrible burden uh, for folks. And uh, I have very real concern about how that's uh, being addressed by uh, Appalachian Power. And I understand completely, and uh, you know, I have spoken about that before, and very much respect uh, those concerns uh, for, for our, our town here and the other localities. We continually assess um, outages. We continually look at those. There's a reliability meeting every week where those are reviewed, and, and look at those communities where there may be issues. Um, I can share with you one program that um, Kevin, I think, is involved in. Well, I know he's involved in. Um, we actually have a pilot that we're, we're just beginning, just initiating, where we've taken circuits from throughout our service area. We will clear those from, from substation all the way to the end. Now, in the past number of years, our strategy has been, our plan has been to clear within the station zone. As you can imagine, that will keep the majority of customers on. Those people will see very few outages. And what I mean there is, is between the substation and the first reclose. Well, I'm getting technical here, I know, but that's that line device that will, you'll see blinks sometimes, and part of the line will go out and stay out, and the rest of it comes back on. So this, what this pilot, this three-year pilot will do is show, we'll, while we'll be looking at various circuits, the uh, rural, urban, town, we'll be looking at those that go over the mountains and, and up and down rivers, we'll look at those that are across the fields, and we will, we will look at, uh, and this is, uh, we're working with, the commission has approved it, uh, we'll be doing an analysis on what improvements can be found. We expect that we'll see improvements, um, but I would caution, the improvements that we'll see will be those on the day-to-day variety. You know, those where we see the operations on the line, where you see lights blink, the, your general routine, day-to-day -day, uh, type of outage. On the major storms like we've had, um, and we've had, we've gone through a period of time, I've been in this business now for, I hate to even admit, but I'm, it's getting close to 30 years, and you put a, you put 10 of us in a room and we've got around 300 years experience <laughs> because we're all about the same variety. Um, same age group, but we um, 
we've, had, we've gone through, it seems like there's years of cycles of storms. So we've just been through a cycle, it seems beginning around 2008, 2009, if you remember we had that very heavy snow in 2009. Oh, yeah. Then we, this, this uh, year in January, a very heavy oh, snow, yeah. but yeah, that one. And, and, and I know, you know, you're, you're going to maybe shocked when I say, it. it was a very fortunate storm because we knew, we knew, we were, we were being told from our internal anal the forecast that, that uh, it was going to hit this I-81 quarter from about here up to the Bithville area. So we, we were wor waiting on that. It was a very confined storm, that one was. 2009 was it? But it was a very confined storm to this area. And so no other utility in the country was hit by that snowstorm and no other um, company within the AEP system. So we were able to have 500 or so resources sitting in, in hotels ready to go when the storm hit. Um, the duration of last summer, another major hit. That one's been a fear of utilities for years. It's one of those widespread storms that, you know, everything from Chicago to the coast, you know, was in the path of that storm. That's a difficult one. But, but hopefully it will cycle down into uh, not the major storms. But, but we, you know, while we know that we're going to receive improvements, um, the major storms still are going to be an impact. And that's something we'll continue to work with as well. And I would only offer this comment. I don't think there's any reason to think that those major storms are going to cycle down. <laughs> there's always hope. <laughs> uh, there's, what I've seen uh, and read and so forth, I don't think we can expect that. I will say that I think Appalachian Power has had an excellent response when there's, you know, been you. these kinds of storms. But again, you know, my primary concern has been anticipating uh, the consequences by doing appropriate, uh, you know, uh, maintenance of the right of ways to uh, prevent those things, but uh, we'll, we'll let that one go. Does anyone else have any questions this evening? I would like to remind you yes, that in Section 3, the word non exclusive is predominant. Okay, so in theory, we could allow another company to operate in theory, in? Okay. in theory, that's just something else, even though there's no one else approved. We would hope okay. that you would always be happy with us. <laughs> <laughs> well, considering that you should be on the lines. Uh, well, Council, you know, uh, uh, what is your pleasure? Uh, should we cont uh, allow App Appalachian Power uh, or American Electric Power uh, to uh, continue to operate uh, or to continue to provide electrical services in the uh, town of Abingdon. I have no idea what the consequences would be if we didn't, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll still be here. But besides, right. and how would you okay. propose well, The legal department would recommend that if we'd yeah. like to continue with some electricity, we'd probably <laughs> recommend to do this. We're kind of depending on it tonight. <laughs> uh, I would entertain a motion regarding this matter. Mr. Mayor, before, yes, the, before the motion, I, on this particular one, in light of the fact that they are the only company company in the service area, I would recommend that the council perhaps enacted on the uh, dispense with the second reading of the ordinance. I think we, think we probably could, considering there were no other applicants. Okay, and again, I'll entertain a motion regarding this. Mr. Mayor, I have a motion. I move that we uh, approve uh, on the first reading and dispense with the second reading to um, grant the franchise to Appalachian Power for the five-year agreement that our town attorney has uh, designed and uh, add that we, well, it's a five-year agreement with five, five-year, not to exceed 30, yeah, not to exceed 30, but I'll just, I move that we uh, approve the franchise as, as presented by the staff and ask that our town manager send a letter to the State Corporation Commission opposing the rate increase this year. I'll second that. Okay, we have a motion in the second and I'm not going to repeat it all. Uh, but I think we have the uh, the gist of it. Um, any further discussion regarding this matter? <coughs> I'll ask our clerk to call the roll, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphreys. Aye. Mr. Berry. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. Thank, thank you very much for coming. You know, I'm sure this hasn't been the most fun evening we've ever had, but I think it is important that we have this uh, discussion from time to time, and uh, we would uh, welcome the opportunity to have you folks come back for a uh, uh, rating. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's already getting to be a long evening. Uh, you know, to have a discussion about uh, your services and your plans for the future, and. Uh, 
uh, as well as you know management of the, the right of ways and safety issues. And we we do thank you for you know uh, providing uh, Mr. Sigmund in this part of the world. He's uh, he really has done some good things. He does good things, does he? And and certainly we thank you for all of that you've done. You do need us for anything. Please let us know and be happy to talk with you at any time about the issues. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, we have uh, next for our consideration a public hearing on the first reading an ordinance of the Council of the Town of Abingdon, Virginia, proposing a budget for the Town of Abingdon, Virginia, to make appropriations for the current expenses of the town and to fix the tax rate upon real and personal property, fix all other local tax rates and fees and rates on utility services for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2013 and ending June 30th, 2014. Uh, Mr. Kelly, what is this about? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, members of the public, um, uh, each year the town, of course, is obligated to adopt a fiscal year budget. Um, by law, I, as the town manager, am required to submit to the council a proposed budget by April the uh, 1st of each year. Uh, in that regard, I did present the same to the council, and the council has had uh, four budget work sessions since that period of time on April 20th, April 21st, April 27th, and April 28th. Um, we did develop a balanced budget, and I am very pleased to say that uh, in balancing the budget, uh, both the general fund budget and the sewer fund budget, we did not have to increase any rates or taxes in order to do that. The uh, proposed balance budget of general fund is $17,822,450, and the sewer fund budget is $3,196,587,000. I would point out to um, Council that in order to balance this budget, it is a larger budget than last year's budget in order to balance that without the necessity of raising taxes. Um, we did have to depend heavily upon grant and reven revenue sharing funds within this budget. Uh, in light of some of the capital improvement plans that we have. We are also transferring from reserves the sum of $550,000 uh, for use in the capital improvement uh, plan, as well as we will be borrowing uh, $1.6 million that will go into um, that particular capital improvement plan. And I would uh, just for the public, point out that uh, several of those projects that are targeted for the current capital improvement plan include um, a project at Country Club Estates, a pedestrian improvement project, uh, Whites Mill Road, Court Street, and Oak Hill Street, the replacement of Creeper Trail Trestle Number 7, an Academy Drive Enhancement Project, uh, Coombe Center renovations and various historic town properties renovation in addition to some uh, significant uh, software and mobile data uh, enhancements to both the police department and to the finance department. Uh, we also have a creeper trail enhancement project including in, in that capital improvement plan. So as you can see, uh, we have hit lots of, of things that we've been uh, planning over the course of the past four years that are go going to come to fruition in uh, the current year. As I have recommended in the budget message that I submitted to the council, I deem it uh, highly imperative that we schedule a retreat at some point in time, financial planning retreat to perhaps do some uh, debt restructuring and to consider how we anticipate funding additional uh, capital improvement plans in the future. Um, again, the budget is balanced um, without the increase of any rates on both the general fund and the sewer fund. And I would note for the record, I believe that we had four uh, additional work sessions as a council on this budget. Uh, you've, I know you and your staff have put a lot of time into it, as did the council. 
and um, you know I'm satisfied that we have a good budget and uh, it will pro enable us to have a very productive year in the town. Okay, uh, we are required to have a uh, public hearing uh, regarding uh, this matter. Again, Mr. Kelly has uh, brought us up to speed that this is in regard to the uh, uh, acting on the first reading on our uh, budget for the 2013-2014 fiscal year. And um, at the present time, I will declare the public hearing to be open. And if there is anyone who wishes to address the council regarding uh, this uh, proposed budget, they uh, may come forward and do so at the present time. Again, if there is anyone who wishes to address the council, they may do so at the present time. There does not appear to be anyone who wishes to address the council. I will therefore declare the public hearing to be closed. Uh, council, what is your pleasure regarding this matter? Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve the budget on the first reading. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a, a second to approve the budget uh, on the first reading. Uh, is there discussion about this matter? Hearing none, I'll ask our clerk to call the roll, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphreys. Aye. Mr. Barry. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. Thank you. Uh, second reading, um, we have an ordinance proposing a real property tax revenue increase for the fisc uh, fiscal year 2013-14 as a result of reassessments. Uh, I'll ask Mr. Kelly to, uh, you know, briefly present this, uh, uh, you know, to us, but I uh, believe I would be correct in saying we are not changing the tax rate, but the net result is to bring in a few more dollars into the coffers. Um, that, that is correct, uh, Mr. Mayor. Every four years uh, when the taxes are reassessed, oftentimes it can lead to an increase in revenue at the current tax rate. Um, that is what happened in this particular um, situation. If it exceeds, uh, I believe, 1% um, um, of, of the prior year, then we have to have a public hearing that is uh, separate and apart from the actual budget public hearing. We did have that public hearing last month and not this month, and so this is simply a second reading to um, adopt this ordinance, which basically indicates that the rate will remain the same. However, the tax revenue will increase in excess of $100,000 as a result of the reassessments. I would point out to um, um, everyone in the public that not every everyone's home in the town of Abingdon increased in value. There were several that decreased in value, but overall there was an increase in tax revenue as a result of the reassessments. With that said, I would uh, ask that the council adopt the ordinance on second read. Uh, council, what is your pleasure on this matter? Well, Mr. Mayor, just, just a question okay. of uh, Mr. Kelly. That amount was, was it 176000 increase in revenue? What was that number? Don't Just for the, high. It, it was around 125 and, and, and it is uh, separately itemized in the budget. In the budget. I just wanted to, okay. the amount for the public. And, and, uh, and we would note for the record, and you may have done this and it slipped by me, but the proposed tax rate is $0.28 cents for $100. Yes. Yeah. Okay, and that would be for both the property and personal property. Uh, personal property is 55 cents. Okay, excuse me. Okay, any other questions uh, that anyone might have about this? I'll entertain a motion. Make a motion we approve this ordinance on the second reading. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve this ordinance on the second reading. Uh, is there any further discussion, comment? Hearing none, Ms. Rosenbaum, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphreys. Aye. Mr. Mayor. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. Okay, uh, next we have consideration of bids. Uh, the first one is uh, for a uh, consideration of bid for a replacement of the Virginia Creeper Trail Trestle number seven, which uh, we were about two years out from an event uh, that I believe was on the 28th of April of uh, 2011, uh, when uh, that uh, trestle was destroyed. And we- uh, we have you down here a little bit later to give us an update on that. I'll bet you you could give us that brief update okay. right now and then uh, <laughs> present those bids too. Well, as much as I like to walk up here, I think I will combine those two efforts. Yeah. Uh, um, Mayor Morgan, members of council, we did receive bids on April 9th uh, for the reconstruction of Virginia Creek Patrol Trestle Number 7. 
and I think you have the results in your packet there. Um, Inland Construction of Abingdon was the low bidder as read, and uh, the bids all have been um, documented and are all responsive. Um, my recommendation to the council would be to award the contract to Inland Construction for $1,108,000. Uh, that's well, well within the, the budgeted amount for the project. Uh, we still have some uh, opportunities uh, that once a uh, contract is rewarded, we uh, do have some opportunities for some potential uh, deducts for use of different types of materials for the decking on the trestle. Uh, so I'd like to explore that after, after we award the contract, if that's all right with the council. All righty, and I know a great deal of effort has been gone has gone into the design of uh, this and, uh, and public input on it, as well as uh, consultation with the landowners. Uh, uh, council had a brief sort of uh, field trip out, out to that property uh, one night uh, last week to get the lay of the land. Thursday. Thursday night, and uh, uh, and we are very pleased to uh, to see this uh, move forward. Uh, council, again, we have a recommendation. To, uh, uh, that we award this contract to Inland Construction for the official amount of $1,108,000 to replace the uh, uh, trestle uh, number seven on the uh, Virginia Creeper Trail. And um, I would comment that uh, although this new trestle is not designed to carry a railroad train, it will uh, look very, have a lot of similarities to what was uh, there previously, be a wooden construction, and it's going to be a good looking, uh, uh, you know, returned asset uh, there to the community. What's your pleasure on this uh, matter, please? I'll make a motion to go ahead with the, the low B at inland construction for the reconstruction of. Uh, Trestle number seven. Very good. Is there a second to that? Uh, I'll second it. Okay, we have a motion and a second to award the um, uh, contract to the low bidder, which is Inland Construction Company, for the amount uh, indicated previously. Um, let's see, any further discussion? Um, Mr. Mayor, while, yes, we're, while we're here, I'd like to take a, just a second to uh, to mention that uh, you know, in doing this, we, we've acquired <coughs> a few partners and partnered with people along the way to get. Uh, everything from uh, aesthetic, uh, aesthetically what would be pleasing, and also uh, structurally, and uh, of course the uh, the uh, uh, Virginia Creeper Trail Club uh, had input on that, as well as all of us. But uh, uh, Steve and Charlie Smith and the Smith Brothers Farm uh, really has been a great partner to us, and and, and has worked very very uh, steady with uh, has been steady all along the way in trying to make sure that this is this is reconstructed and properly reconstructed. Yeah. And I think that's. Uh, uh, that was very evident this past Thursday night. So I'd like to like to also commend them for all their hard work uh, helping us bring this around. Uh, and our staff has put a tremendous amount of effort into you know helping to shape this up as well. Thank you for your efforts on that. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, any further comment? I'll ask Ms. Rosenbaum to call the roll, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mr. Bain. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. And one final question: When would you anticipate that we'll be out there for the ribbon cutting? I would hope we'd be out there probably the first of June. Okay. It'll take a little bit of time to All swap right. contracts. And All right. That's when we do the brown, uh, ground breaking right. for it. And He's then talking about when he finished. Yeah. He finished. Oh, finish. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the finish uh, uh, is anticipated to be about eight months after that. Okay. Um, Great. We might have our winter clothes on for that one, Mr. Mayor. Well, that'll, that'll be fine. We'll we'll ski on out there. Okay, thank you very much. Now, while we have you in the neighborhood, our next item is a consideration of bids for the Country Club Estates Drainage Improvement Project. And again, I think there's an opportunity uh, later in the agenda to give an update, and I'll bet sure. you can handle that one. Now, um, too. Give my best effort. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Dew. We also received uh, bids on April 30th for the Country Club Estates Drainage Project, and you uh, should also have those results uh, as read in your packet. Uh, the low bidder was Boring Contractors Incorporated, uh, also of Abingdon. Um, base bid $226,165 with an ad alternate uh, of $7,875. Um, the ad alternate is, in my opinion, key to the uh, uh, success of the construction of the project, and um, my recommendation to Council would be to uh, award the contract in the amount of $234,040 uh, for both the base bid and the ad alternate to uh, boring contractors. Okay. All right. 
uh, again, the, this is a project that has been going on uh, in one form or another for about 20 years, and uh, possibly even longer than that. And uh, and I'm sure that Ms. Eisenhower and Jim Smith feel like they've been involved every step of the way for the last 20 years. Uh, but this has been something that we have worked uh, long and hard, and a lot of people never thought we would live to see the day when we uh, have this for consideration. And I offer my personal appreciation and thanks to the folks that brought this thing forward, because it is a major uh, <laughs> Uh, accomplishment to actually uh, do it and it's one of those things that uh, has been difficult to achieve but it's one of the uh, but it has brought home to me that there are some things that really it, it only government can accomplish uh, in terms of coordinating uh, the effective parties and the resources that are necessary to bring relief it's also pointed out to me the need for good solid planning and to begin with uh, so that problems like this don't occur uh, we will know for the record we didn't make this one we inherited it um, I will entertain a motion please mr. mayor I move that we award the contract to Boeing contractors for the amount of two hundred thirty four thousand forty dollars okay is there a second, second. We have a motion and a second to uh, award the uh, contract to the low bidder, boring construction. Any further comments or questions? Hearing none, Ms. Rosenbaum, if you'll call the roll, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mr. Barry. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. And, and I say that with pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, uh, for all your work. And, and uh, this is one we do look forward to the groundbreaking <laughs> on as well as the completion. Okay, and we, do we have you down for any other updates? One additional. Um, okay. It's the uh, asphalt resurfacing work. Yes, this sir. is a yearly contract. Um, we opened bids uh, for that project also on April 30th. Uh, the low and only bidder was uh, American Electric Power. No, it was uh, <laughs> 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 WNA. <laughs> 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 yeah. yeah. WNA w Construction and Baby. <laughs> Um, and the, the bid was $204,010. Uh, we'll note that it's uh, s uh, slightly above about uh, $10,000 higher than the amount that's remaining in that particular budget item, uh, but we do have uh, money and other street improvement related items that uh, we can and have before uh, transferred over to cover this amount to make sure that we are able to pave the roads that we, that we deemed uh, in need this year. So my recommendation would be to award the, the contract for the full bid amount of $204,010. Very good, sir. And, uh, you know, we certainly need to award this contract. I would note we, we don't have many potholes in town, and that's probably <laughs> because we're able to, uh, you know, do this. Yes, question for... Um, Mr. Dew, uh, where in town will this be, just for everybody's FYI? It's numerous locations. Uh, I could try to rattle them off off the top big, of my head. Big areas. Big uh, they're all small streets this time, mostly except for Colonial Road. Uh, there's a pretty good section of Colonial that's going to be paved. Other than that, it's it's really a, a lot of uh, local streets. We've, we've tended to focus the last several years on some of the, the larger roads. We have Main Street several sections of Main Street we'd like to do in the upcoming years and devote. That will probably take just about every bit of the budget and then some to do that. So this year was uh, mostly local streets. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Dew, regarding this matter? Okay. We have a proposal to uh, award the uh, uh, the contract to, uh, I believe it was WNL. Was that? Uh, That's correct. Okay. Um, I'll entertain a motion, please. I'll make a motion that we go with the low bidder of WNL construction and paving. Okay. I'll second. We have a motion and a second to award the contract to uh, the low bidder, which was WNL Construction Company. Any further comment? Uh, hearing none, I'll ask our clerk to call the roll, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphreys. Aye. Mr. Barry. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. Okay, we have one more bid, which is consideration of uh, a bid for a boiler heat exchanger refurbishment for the uh, Wolf Creek Water Reclamation uh, Facility. Mr. Jim Smith, our town engineer, who uh, survived the country club in straight <laughs> the state uh, uh, Congratulations. Uh, marathon. So far. Uh, thank you, sir. <laughs> thank you. Good morning, members of the town council. On April 25th, uh, we did receive bids uh, for the repair of uh, the boiler heat exchanger at our sewer treatment facility. 
the lowest bid price was submitted by TNV contractors, and it was for a total amount of $173,700, and that is about $44,000 above the engineer's estimate, and it is also over our budgeted amount. Our consultant uh, CHA uh, engineers has uh, they have reviewed uh, the bids and they've submitted a couple of recommendations. One of the recommendations is to enter into negotiations with the lowest bidder, and that is allowed by the Virginia procurement law. And uh, they have determined, uh, our consultant has determined that. Uh, if we can negotiate the uh, price down to less than $145,000, that we will have enough left in our budget to complete the project. The uh, other suggestion, recommendation that they had was to uh, uh, um, <coughs> if, if the negotiations with TNB did not work out, then uh, we would uh, reject all of the bids and then the town uh, would attempt to enter into a contract with the three uh, subcontractors and we feel like that if we can do that we can keep uh, the amount down to within uh, the budgeted amount. We do have a recommendation and my recommendation is that the uh, town council authorize the town manager to enter into the negotiations and uh, contracts uh, as necessary as they've been outlined in our in the memo to Mr. Uh, Kelly. Thank you very much. So moved. Okay. Uh, well, someone would be willing to make that motion. Uh, yes, sir. M Mr. Mayor, if I could uh, perhaps get Mr. Barry to add just a little bit to that so moved and, and that if we are able to successfully negotiate uh, down below that recommended amount of 145000 that council authorized me to enter into the agreement without having to bring it back before council. Well, but you Absolutely. Be agreeable to that. All right. Very good, sir. Is there a second? I'll second it. We have a motion and a second uh, uh, to proceed as recommended uh, regarding uh, entering into negotiations with the low bidder and uh, taking action as uh, uh, deemed appropriate by, as outlined by Mr. Kelly. I'll let somebody straighten that out eventually in the, when they write it out. That'll be Ms. Rosenbaum's challenge. <laughs> I'll, I'll certify, I'll certify. Yeah, I'm yes, that's, uh, we, she will be, uh, uh, it's a good thing she is certified, but I'm proud that she can clean that up. Any further discussion about this matter? Uh, hearing none, I'll ask her to call the roll, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mr. Bayer. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. Thank you very much. Okay, that brings us through the bid uh, uh, cycle here. Uh, our next item is under reports from the town manager. We have consideration of the of assignment agreement to transfer from King College Incorporated to the King School of Medicine Incorporated the rights and responsibilities pursuant to the agreement by and between the town of Abingdon, Virginia, the County of Washington, Virginia, and King College Incorporated regarding economic incentives for a medical school to be established by King College in the town of Abingdon. Mr. Tarek Zaidi, who is interim president and chief operating officer of the, uh, quote, King School of Medicine, I believe would be the appropriate title, uh, is here to discuss that with us tonight. And um, I think you'll find us probably very agreeable. But Great. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. All right. Town Council. Uh, Mr. Kelly. Uh, it, Little history uh, when we uh, came uh, it, when we after we left here with your generous donation of fifty thousand dollars we went to the county uh, as we talked with the county they raised uh, a question about the uh, designee being the King School of Medicine as opposed to the original uh, King College Inc. Despite the fact that that original agreement uh, did have a place in it to, uh, to to take into consideration that King College might not be the ultimate. Um, party to take the project forward. There was a, a provision in there for its designee. However, everybody felt like it was in the best interest to really make this change. And I would say, and Ms. Eisenhower can, can chime in, but really it's an academic change. It, it, there's no substantive no pun, change to no it. Pun no pun intended. <laughs> no. I'd like to say I, I knew that was, I uh -huh. put that in place on, on purpose. <laughs> But on Monday, so no, uh, I didn't. But um, it just changes the name of the parties. 
Uh, we take over responsibility for the project. Uh, there are the normal and standard indemnifications that go back for the period that King College was involved, but really there are none because they had no activity under the grant per se with, with Washington County and with Abingdon. Um, this, this agreement was crafted based on what King College had already signed uh, on November 28th of 2012 when we uh, uh, it took in a, uh, entered into a similar agreement with the Tobacco Commission. So this language has already been, uh, had been vetted by Tobacco Commission by King College. We felt like mirroring that agreement would actually make it easier to get the agreement done. Um, and so really it changes names. There are no other changes to the document itself. But I would note that the date for signature on there on the first page, Ms. Rosenbaum, as you look through it, is, is April blank. We may just want to strike through that when we execute it and put May, uh, the whatever May date, assuming that uh, this, this council executes it. Any, uh, did I leave anything out? I think you got it. Right. Okay. So, you. The, so the gist of it is that this is no longer a specifically uh, King College operated uh, project. It has its own established and independent board of directors that would be responsible for the operation of the, uh, the proposed school. That is correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. And again, we have the recommendation that we assign uh, our commitment uh, to this new body, which uh, Mr. Barry serves on. Um, at the present time, uh, and as opposed to King College, is there questions of Mr. Zadie? Uh, if if I could, I can get a brief update just of a couple of things that have happened since we we're here last. Yes, sir. Um, the project continues as we move forward uh, in taking a look at it. The board's very conscious of of moving this project forward in a way, not just to get the school built, but as we talked about, to do it in a reasonable manner, which is sustainable. We feel like we're well on our way, and especially uh, partnering with. ETSU in Quillen, uh, we've taken a look at, at other ways to partner with local institutions and schools and hopefully in the next uh, short while we'll be able to enter into some more of those agreements that will really transform this into truly an Avon Washington County centric uh, project that retains a, a Virginia identity um, but, is, but reaches out to other institutions of the community so that we can be good stewards and good partners uh, bringing in other institutions allowing them to join with us in improving the quality of health, but also creating jobs and economic development and, and bringing stability to the region. As we've talked that message and talked with people about that message, it's, it has gained momentum and, and, been, um, and resonated with people. Uh, as you probably know, on April 4th, I think the General Assembly and the, the governor's veto budget uh, awarded us a $250,000 planning grant, which we know you all are helping with. It actually came through the town of Abingdon, so we really appreciate the work. And we are working with Ms. Eisenhower and Mr. Dew to get our RFP out so that we can get those plans up and going and moving very quickly to have the, the, the new plans put together in place. Uh, we also met with um, Washington County, and they matched your $50,000 uh, with their own $50,000 donation. So um, we appreciate them, but we appreciate you for stepping out and, and really taking the lead on this. So thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, last Friday, uh, I met with um, the Tobacco Commission staff in a pre-meeting for our April 22nd, 23rd commission meeting. Uh, and I, my impression of that meeting was uh, that it went very well. They're very supportive. Uh, they see that there has been a lot of progress made. We've really talked about this project in terms of November 28th forward. Um, and though we don't have an agreement, final agreement with ETSU yet, we're working very hard towards that. Uh, I received an agreement from them late today uh, which defines the guiding principles of an agreement that we would reach with them. First and foremost, I think, is that um, this would be a four-year school. It's located in Abingdon, Virginia, and the facilities uh, will be owned and operated by King School of Medicine, Inc., the Virginia entity. Um, the other part of that, which I think is very important, is Virginia's support will stay in Virginia, Tennessee's support stay in Tennessee, but we will work collaboratively on making it a, a, a project that will last for, for a long time and, and reap benefits of it. So I uh, just wanted to give you all a little update on that, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions that you all might have. Thank you very much. Are there questions? I guess the question that keeps coming up, eventually, the King name yeah. will, will <laughs> somewhere go away. We are, we are working through that. Let's, I guess, I guess the right answer in our, uh, let, let me, 
be as diplomatic as I can with this. The new, we, we all perceive that there will be a name for the school right. that will be reflective of both the region right. okay. and um, the collaboration with ETSU. And we've had a lot of discussions. That's, that's, that's well, it is, it, it is a main, main talking point and it's an issue and something we're aware of. that we could do now mm -hmm. in this agreement? Not in this agreement, okay. no. Yeah. What, and can, I, can I just add one comment? Sure. Um, King School of Medicine Inc. is a Virginia corporation, nonprofit, state corporation. So it's a Virginia entity. Um, as the board looks at names, along with Quillen as a partner, it'll be a name that will reflect our community here. And legally, I think King School of Medicine Inc. will be the company and will do business as whatever that new name is. Yeah. And later down the road, we could change the right. company name as well. And, and I would note for the record, and I'll do respect to the King name, even though uh, it's used a bit for some other purposes right now. I believe William King was the first person to support uh, academic <laughs> education <laughs> in southwestern Virginia. Who, uh, he made a, a donation, I believe, of $10,000, which was a princely sum at that time, mm -hmm. and uh, established, what was it, the Abingdon Male Academy. And uh, that particular institution launched the uh, very successful careers of an awful lot of uh, uh, government and professional persons in, in this region. So there, there's something to be said in, the, in <laughs> no, terms of that. that. But that was a different king. It was. It was. <laughs> it was. Uh, but very good. Okay, any further questions? I, I just think yes, it's just something I've always kind of wondered, and, and, and I guess this is a good time. I probably could have asked Jason. probably have been better. But um, has King financially benefited from this at all? No. Did they did they get any money in their coffers? Because there's a there, there's the word going around that they uh, they benefited and had got some money in their coffers to a tune of about four hundred thousand dollars. And I was just wondering if that was true or not. Well, they received a match reimbursement of I think four hundred fifty five thousand dollars from the Tobacco Commission. But that mat that was a match sum. They had to show that they had incurred equal costs of $455,000, and though that was a different administration, peripherally I was able to watch that going on, and I know that that took uh, probably about six months or so to get resolved, and I know that they were very, tobacco was very, um, had, a, had a keen eye on everything going on, so I wouldn't say, I, my, my opinion is they didn't benefit at all from this project, it, not in a financial way. Though they did receive some reimbursement, that is correct. Okay. Well, they did have some uh, real costs. They know, did. Thanks to the and they had this, I mean, they, they had the project for over three years. Right, and I guess they probably split administrative costs, like uh, the, the, the person that headed it up then uh, probably received reimbursement for not only his, his presidential role, but his role on the, as, as champion in that. You know, I haven't seen all those documents, but I know one of the things that the Tobacco Commission was very, con was, was very, um, had a close eye on was when it came to services, being able to document mm -hmm. specifically how much time was spent, mm -hmm. uh, especially when you have dual roles mm -hmm. in dual places. So that they they spent a lot of time on that, and I know that it was it was looked at with a close eye. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. We have a motion to uh, essentially transfer our uh, commitment to the from uh, King College to the uh, King School of Medicine, which is a Virginia corporation. Uh, I'll entertain a motion. Make a motion that we approve this agreement. I'll second that. Yeah, we have a motion and a second to approve the agreement as uh, uh, presented to us. Any further discussion? Uh, Ms. <coughs> Rosenbaum, if you'll call the roll, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphreys. Aye. Mr. Berry. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. Thank you very much for all your efforts. It's a pleasure to see things moving forward. Well, thank you, and it's always a pleasure to come and visit with you. Very good, sir. We appreciate regular updates on, uh, on how things are going. Uh, I'm not beating anybody up. I'm <laughs> truly appreciative, appreciative of all that you have done, and I do mean that. I, I honestly feel, and I will say this for the record right now, that the uh, proposed institution is on sound footing and has uh, you know, it's I in the real world, and it, and I remain optimistic that things are going in the direction that they should be. Thank you very much for Thank you, all I, you've I, done. I appreciate it again. Without your all's support, we wouldn't be able to Thank you very much. We look forward to uh, to that groundbreaking. Which one? We already done one. <laughs> 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 we have the pre-groundbreaking. But this time we'll actually break. <laughs>
Uh, this time we'll, we'll even use shovels, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, this evening, uh, we also, uh, um, Mr. Jackson, I'll ask you to come forward. I think he, uh, you have an introduction to make this evening. Mr. Mayor, members of the council, uh, this evening we have with us the uh, the newly appointed director of the Mount Rogers Planning District Commission, Mr. Michael Armbrister. He was appointed uh, by the board, the executive board of the MRPDC on April 4th at their, uh, their dinner, spring dinner at the Bristol train station. Uh, Michael's a classmate of mine from Emory and Henry, and I know uh, Mr. Taylor, who's also a classmate of ours, uh, we're all excited to work with him and his staff at Mount Rogers in the future. So he's going to talk to you guys about uh, the planning district and what it has to offer. Very good, sir. Thank you, Garrett. Uh, Mr. Mayor, members of the council, I'm very happy to be here tonight. Uh, I understand it's been a while since you've had a representative from the PDC talk to you, so um, I thought I would just provide some information about the planning district, uh, what we do, some of the projects that we've worked on in Washington County, and um, and then give you some information about some some opportunities that are that are coming up down the road. Uh, you should have a handout uh, about the PDC that I uh, sent to Garrett today. I'm sorry I didn't get that to you earlier. Um, but uh, talking about the PDC, we, uh, the commission is authorized under the Regional Cooperation Act, but we're chartered by our local governments. So we are an extension of local government, and we work for our local governments. Um, and the town of Abingdon is one of the original charter members of the PDC, and Vice Mayor Lowe is the representative on our commission. We have a one annual commission meeting a year, and that's our dinner meeting that occurs uh, the first Thursday of April. And then our executive committee meets monthly. Uh, to handle all of the business of the commission. Uh, PDC has two core purposes. Uh, the first is to promote and support collaboration between our local governments, and the second is um, to provide technical assistance to our local governments and community and economic development. And through those purposes, we hope to add capacity at the local level, reduce costs, and improve the quality of life of the citizens in our district. Uh, we, we have a very large district. We serve six counties, two cities, and 12 towns. So we have a lot of partners that we work with, uh, a lot of local governments. We also work with partners at the regional level, the state level, and the federal level. Uh, we represent our local governments uh, well, when we work with state agencies like the Department of Housing and Community Development, uh, VDOT, uh, and a number of other uh, organizations. Uh, if you look at the, the budget section on the handout that you have, uh, you'll see that our current fiscal year budget is around $850,000. And we've been able to secure $4, around $4.50 for every $1 of local funding, and that's for our operations. Uh, it, it, the biggest chunk of our budget comes from the services that we provide, the projects that we administer, project management, grant administration, grant writing. Uh, and, and I wanted to talk about some of the projects we're working on in Washington County, and you may have heard some about. Uh, we've working on, we're working on two downtown redevelopment projects, one in the town of Glade Spring and one in Damascus. In March, we submitted a, an application to DHCD for CDBG funding for Glade Spring, and that will be for implementation. Uh, we'll be working on new facades, uh, some sidewalk improvements, uh, and basic economic restructuring in downtown Glade. Uh, Damascus, we recently submitted and were awarded a planning grant to look at their uh, economic restructuring. And in Damascus, we're going to be looking at trying to create a, an annual economy instead of the seasonal economy that they've been struggling with over the past several years. Uh, we'll be tying that to some other uh, regional opportunities like Appalachian Spring and outdoor recreation and trying to tie that into their downtown uh, redevelopment. Uh, with Washington County, we're working on two water projects uh, in the communities of Mendota and Hidden Valley. Uh, we're working on um, some replacement of some old outdated water lines and also some new extensions. Uh, so there'll be some new service from both of those projects. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited about a project we have with Washington County that we're about to start uh, uh, this week, actually. Uh, and that's we're going to provide project management for the county's roadside replacement project, uh, roadside replacement. So um, that's a, a three-year project. It's not tied to any grant funding. And, and this is one of the first times that we've ever provided grant man or project management uh, without grant funding. And that's something that we can do, um, work through the procurement and the uh, working with the contractor and um, taking that responsibility away from county staff and, and handling that, that for them at a, at a low cost. 
And for the town of Addington, uh, we're currently working on a data update for the comprehensive plan. We should have that finished up soon. Uh, when it's finished, we'll provide that to, to town staff and they can move forward with the comprehensive plan update. Uh, we're also, we'll also be serving on the management team for the, the mixed use and fill feasibility study, uh, which will start very soon. Uh, and then we're, we're excited about anything we can do to help that project um, to allow it to move forward. Uh, again, we work for our local governments and anything we can do to help with capacity and cost savings, that's what we're here for. Um, so those are some of the things I wanted to talk about, uh, PDC, and, and also on your on the handout, there's some of the impacts uh, that we've, the projects that we've worked on, uh, the benefits that we've seen in our region. Uh, one thing I wanted to point out under the impact section there is uh, over the past five years, we've been able to secure over $29 million in grant funding uh, as a partner with our local governments and, and regional organizations. And if, if you look at that compared to the local funding that we've received for our operations, it's, it's about $38 of grant funding into our region for every $1 of local funding that we've received. Um, and our goal is, is, to, is, to, is to grow that. Uh, we, want, we want to do as much as we can to bring grant funding and projects and, and the opportunity for projects in our region and to support our local governments. Uh, so some, some of the opportunities coming up, uh, I wanted to let you know that we have been notified by DHCD that we will receive level funding for the, the Commission's Water Wastewater Construction Fund, and applications for that, uh, that fund will come out this week. And if the town has any eligible projects, uh, sewer projects, we would be happy to, to consider those. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to contact me about that. Uh, we've also, uh, since October, I've been meeting with our county administrators. And we want to pull into uh, into these meetings our town managers. So this summer we're going to have a, a meeting with all of our town managers, uh, city managers, and county administrators, which is an opportunity to talk about uh, issues of, of um, that everybody shares. Uh, the county administrators and, and the, we've met probably four times. We've talked about budget issues, um, concerns about dealing with personnel, um, uh, cost of health insurance, um, taxes. You know, wh whatever items come up for the county administrators they want to talk about, this is a forum for them to do that. Uh, we want to provide that for our town managers as well. I think it's, it's an important opportunity uh, for the managers and administrators as well for the PDC to allow us to stay in touch and see what we can do, um, again, to help our local governments. And finally, this year we'll be working on an update for our regional economic development strategy. And we'll be working with our local governments to collect information, uh, local goals, things that we need in our district, what we'd like to see, um, and those types of things. So we'll be, we'll be contacting uh, town staff in the coming months to work on that. And um, I guess if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Well, for starters, we want to thank you for being here. Uh, it has been a while since we've had a representative from the uh, Planning District Commission come and, uh, uh, and uh, talk with you about, with us about, uh, you know, the activities of the Commission, and uh, we understand the important role that it plays in, uh, in providing services in this part of the world. Uh, I don't have any questions, but do other council members have any? I don't. I do not. Thank you very much. You've been very patient, uh, you know, to first of all to come and to wait uh, through us as we struggle through our other items tonight. And uh, uh, thank you. And please let us know if we can be of any assistance to you folks as well. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, our next item is a uh, consideration of an amendment to the town's small uh, purchase policy. Mr. Kelly. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor, members of council. Basically, um, uh, the state of Virginia authorizes a locality to uh, uh, go up to $50,000 in small purchases. We have held theirs back at the amount, I believe, of $35,000 over the course of the past um, several years, uh, back from when it was last amended. Um, oftentimes, this puts us in a bind of having to put things out to bid that we otherwise would not have to do. And since the state allows us to go up to that $50,000 threshold, uh, I am requesting that uh, you authorize me to adopt an amendment to our current small purchases policy that increases that upper tier uh, of thirty to fifty thousand dollars. So, if I understand this correctly, if the item is uh, 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 in our budget, in other words, we budgeted for these items, uh, we would be permitted to move forward 
um, under what consideration? Uh, again, would there uh, have to be bids taken on this? Or? Uh, no. If if you notice in the in the act, if if the item is three thousand dollars or less, it's uh, discretionary with the department head. Um, to make that determination, anywhere from three thousand to twenty-nine thousand nine hundred ninety-nine dollars, uh, at least two and three, whenever possible, written or verbal quotations, and then when we get to the thirty to fifty thousand, we have to have at least two and three, whenever possible, written quotations from non-governmental uh, vendors. Uh, that are required, but if any of those items that would fall within that grouping are budgeted items, they would not have to be um, put out for further bid or brought before the council for approval. Okay. <clears throat> the council, do you have questions of Mr. Kelly regarding this matter? Okay. Uh, what's your pleasure regarding this? I think it sounds like a reasonable request. I would. I would make a motion that we, um, do we need to change an amend or do we to authorize? Just authorize, authorize me to oh. execute the small purchases policy uh, presented. I could not have said it better. Second. Uh, excellent <laughs> job with both of you. Okay, any further discussion? Uh, hearing none, I'll ask our clerk to call the roll, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphreys. Aye. Mr. Bayer. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to consideration of an additional appropriation to the Barter Theater for the final disposition of Barter Municipal Building Expansion Project. Uh, Mr. Kelly? Um, yes, Mr. Mayor. If uh, Council will recall, um, we've been undergoing some negotiations with Barter relative to the cost and expenses of the recent uh, uh, renovation of the municipal building and the barter theater where the two were connected and the town acquired some additional space as well as a secure fire rated stairwell um, as an exit from from all floors of the or from yes all floors of the municipal building um, after talking with barter and negotiating uh, we have reached an agreement that uh, the sum of fifty thousand dollars would um, would uh, uh, carry out the full extent of the balance of the project, and in exchange for that, we would be entering into a memorandum of understanding with Barter Theater that we would we would have access to full use of the theater on the weekends of the month of January and other times when there are down times and and the theater is available. And the town would uh, receive all of the profits, the net profits from those events that took place uh, in January that we have termed the January jams until such time as the profits uh, equal $50,000. At that point in time, then we would go back to a split with partner of the net profits. And those are profits you're describing as opposed to net receipts. Exactly, and uh, the original um, term term of the uh, memorandum of understanding was um, uh, five years. However, uh, Barter did indicate that should they um, go back to holding uh, plays in the month of January at some future time, then they would reserve the right to come back and and negotiate with us on on the use but uh, mr. Rose in an email to me indicated there was no plans to do that in the future negotiator <laughs> yeah very good okay uh, any questions mr. Kelly regarding this matter I think he's done I think he's done well yeah okay uh, uh, I'll entertain a motion Mr. Mayor, I move that we uh, appropriate $50,000 from council contingency to the Barter Theater and authorize the town manager to enter into the MOU with the Barter Theater, uh, as he just discussed. I second that. Very good. You gentlemen have done very well. We have a motion and a second uh, to provide uh, the additional uh, funding that has been described. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, Ms. Rosenbaum, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mr. Barry. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. Okay, and we have uh, item number five, consideration of additional appropriation uh, for the uh, Veterans Memorial Park Board. Mr. Kelly? Um, it's not appearing on my 
agenda for some reason. Mr. Mayor, I, I, if I recall, I believe at uh, the last uh, council um, meeting that the council discussed uh, using some of the remaining contingency funds under the current fiscal year uh, for the purpose of uh, granting additional funding to the Veterans Memorial um, Park. And I believe that's something that Mr. Barry had uh, raised in the budget discussions and uh, we did but I right off the top of my head I forget the amount <laughs> okay well, it, it was fifteen thousand dollars sir okay um, and uh, that would be for, uh, from the balance of the contingencies we've set aside for this year is that what we're proposing yes, sir it are is you, sir uh, are you folks prepared to address this tonight or uh, do you want to talk about it when we're more awake it's going to be midnight anyway. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready. All right. Are you ready? What have you put ahead? I'd like, to, I'd like to make a motion that we appropriate $15,000 contingency for the Veterans Memorial Park. Second to the motion. We have a motion to second, uh, you know, as previously presented. Any further discussion? Hearing <coughs> none, uh, uh, I'll ask our clerk to call the roll, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mr. Berry. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. Okay, and that brings us uh, to uh, passage of resolutions. There are a couple of people out here who have been uh, very patient as we've uh, progressed through this uh, agenda uh, tonight. Uh, the first resolution is a, a resolution of the Council of the Town of Abingdon, Virginia, declaring the month of May 2013 as Older Americans Month. And I see that we have Ms. Davina Sexton, who is director of the Abingdon Senior Center uh, here with us this evening. If you care to come forward and talk with us about uh, that proposed resolution, please. Mayor Morgan, Council Members, Mr. Kelly, and Ms. Rosenbaum. Uh, <laughs> my name is Davina Sexton. I am the director of the Abingdon Senior Center, uh, which, as you know, serves residents 50 years and older in Washington County in the town of Abingdon. I appreciate the opportunity to address you tonight. Uh, May, which you may or may not know, is National Older Americans Month. Uh, which recognizes contributions that are made by older residents um, throughout the country here in our own communities. Um, as I think most of, of you all are already aware, our seniors contribute countless hours. They are in our hospital. They are working in our arts organizations. They're at Barter at William King and the Arts Depot for our other nonprofits with the Historical Society, the Library Foundation, at the Senior Center itself, uh, among many others. They're also working in our churches, in our civic clubs, our schools. Um, those older residents are improving the quality of life for residents of all ages, and they are doing so at no cost to anybody, with the likely exception of themselves. Um, but I'm here tonight to ask you, in recognition of those contributions, that you would adopt a proclamation designated May 2013 as National as Older Americans Month in the town of Abingdon. And that resolution reads as follows. Whereas the town of Abingdon, Virginia includes 2,270 citizens ages 60 and older, and whereas the town of Abingdon is committed to valuing all individuals and recognizing their ongoing life achievements, and whereas the older adults in the town of Abingdon play an important role by continuing to contribute experience, knowledge, wisdom, and accomplishments, and whereas our older adults are active community members involved in volunteering, mentorship, arts and culture, and civic engagement, and whereas recognizing the successes of community elders encourages their ongoing participation and further accomplishments, and whereas our community can provide opportunities to allow older citizens to continue to flourish by emphasizing the importance of elders and their leadership by publicly recognizing their continued achievements, presenting opportunities for older Americans to share their wisdom, experience, and skills, recognizing older adults as a valuable asset in strengthening American communities. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the Town of Abingdon, Virginia, that May 2013 is declared Older Americans Month. We, the Council, urge every citizen to take this month to recognize older adults and the people who serve and support them as powerful and vital citizens who greatly contribute to their community. And we thank you very much.
much for considering that request. And I would note for the record that there are at least uh, four older Americans who share <laughs> their wisdom, of experience and skills on the end of Virginia Town Council. <laughs> And, uh, and make valuable contributions to it. Uh, Council, what is your pleasure regarding this resolution? I would move, uh, Mr. Mayor, that we adopt this resolution, making May uh, 2013 uh, the Older American Month. All righty. Second to the motion. We uh, and made by several oh, yeah. Yeah. And for the record, Mr. Mayor, I'm good Lord willing, I'm working to join the club. We're optimistic that you will be there. We look forward to you uh, your joining us. But there's no need to have seen. There you go. Thank you very much. Uh, if you're uh, Ms. Rosenbaum, please call the roll. For the record, I am not working to join the club. Uh, <laughs> I'm on Twitter only. That's right. I'm okay. uh, Mr. Howard. Hi. Mr. Humphreys. Aye. Mr. Barry. Aye. Mayor Morgan. I want to. Aye. <laughs> okay. Thank you very, Thank you very much. much. And for your patience uh, again with us uh, this evening. All right. We have uh, for our consideration another uh, month, uh, or another resolution uh, tonight, and that is a resolution of the Council of the Town of Abingdon uh, concerning Mental Health Month and National Children's Mental Health Awareness uh, Day in the Town of Abingdon. I believe Ms. Ellen Myatt is here tonight. Uh, to talk with us about that. Again, another very patient person. <laughs> That's a pleasure being here. Thanks. I'm glad Davila went first. <laughs> She's my role model. Um, well, good evening. My name is Ellen Myatt, and I'm the director of the HCS Foundation on behalf of Highlands Community Services. So I thank you, Mayor Morgan, members of the council, Mr. Kelly, uh, for the opportunity to be here this evening. And I also want to thank Ms. Rosemont for all your help in getting me here. And I want to congratulate you on your sterling success. It's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> I've lived in Abingdon for the last eight months uh, working with Highlands. And in that time, I've come to learn that the mental health, intellectual disability, and substance abuse services that they provide clearly do have an impact on the lives of the consumers that they serve. While these vital comprehensive operating services are an integral part of our community, many people do remain unaware of the need for such services, let alone the providers of these services. So I'm here today to request a resolution that designates May as Mental Health Month, and particularly May 9th as National Children's Mental Health Awareness Day in Abingdon. Uh, this will help us in our efforts to increase awareness of the need for and the availability of mental health, substance abuse, and intellectual disability services. Now, if you will permit me, just a real brief history. Mental Health Month was established in 1949 to help bring attention to the, important mental, to the importance mental health plays in the lives of Americans, and it is an opportunity to shine a light on important issues. In 1963, shortly before President John F. Kennedy was assassinated, he called for a bold new approach to mental health. That approach emphasized prevention, treatment, education, and recovery, instead of shame and stigma. That call to action led to the Community Mental Health Act and federal investment in community mental health centers by 1968. Highlands Community Services Board was established in 1972 to serve Washington County and the city of Bristol as the central access point by which individuals could receive mental health and behavioral health services. And let me tell you, the need is growing. One area in particular which you may be aware of is autism. According to the CDC, one in 88 children will fall somewhere on the autism spectrum. Now, a couple of years ago, that was one in 88 boys in particular. Now it's one in 56. And there doesn't seem to be a definitive understanding as to why. Mental health is gaining more attention, but the message is not always clearly communicated, especially in a time of crisis. For instance, mass shootings in 
domestic violence have dominated headlines in recent months, and it's difficult to ignore the tragedies that have taken place in Colorado, Connecticut, and most recently Boston, nor should they be ignored. However, it is easy to ignore the problem. We as a community need to be better, better educated about mental health. According to the National Alliance of Mental Health, one in four adults, approximately 57.7 million Americans, experience a mental health disorder in a given year. They shoulder conditions such as depression and anxiety. That's on the lighter side. For example, an estimated 40 million individuals are affected by such issues as panic disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, generalized anxiety disorder, and phobias. And we haven't gotten to substance abuse yet or other more challenging disorders. And even though there is help out there, reportedly less than half the people in need of treatment seek treatment. It doesn't affect my family as another misconception. Directly or indirectly, we are all affected at some point by, the issue, by issues of mental health, and certainly as a community. It's time to increase awareness not only about mental health issues that are more commonplace than many of us realize, but also we must increase awareness about the much needed comprehensive wraparound services available right here and provide that provide optimal continuum care for those in need. Care that leads to improving lives and discovering possibilities. Recently, President Obama as Secretary of Education and the United States Secretary of Health and Human Services to start a national dialogue on mental health later this year. The goal is to increase awareness about mental health and reduce fear, shame, and misperceptions that too often prevent people from getting the help that they need. Their effort is expected to help make it easier for young people, adults, and families struggling with these health problems to seek help and support. And guess what? We can do that right now, right here. According to the Secretary of Health and Human Services, quote, all of us, including teachers, parents, neighbors, and friends, have a role to play in helping to increase awareness and break down the stigma around mental health. Together, we can bring mental health illness out of the shadows. And that's the goal of Highlands Community Services, which provides services to more than 1,600 children and more than 3,000 adults in a given year. Five years ago, that was 440 children, and that was 2,000 adults. So as you can see, the need is growing. On behalf of Highlands Community Services, I'm asking this body of leaders to designate May as Mental Health Month and May 9th as National Children's Mental Health Awareness Day in Abingdon. Well, I believe you have a copy. I do, and it will uh, be my pleasure to read it into the record, which is uh, part of our normal procedure. And uh, I would note that whereas mental health is essential to everyone's overall health and well-being, and whereas all Americans experience times of difficulty and stress in their lives, and whereas prevention is an effective way to reduce the burden of mental health co uh, conditions, and whereas there is a strong body of research that supports specific tools that all Americans can use to better handle challenges and to protect their health and well-being, and whereas Mental health conditions are real and prevalent in our nation, and whereas with effective treatment, those individuals with mental health conditions can recover and lead full uh, productive lives, and whereas each business, school, government agency, healthcare provider, organization, and citizen shares the burden of mental health problems and has a responsibility to promote mental wellness and support prevention efforts, now, th therefore, be it resolved by the Council of the Town of Abingdon, Virginia, that we declare that May 2013 uh, as Mental Health Month and May 9th, 2013 is National Children's Mental Health Awareness Day in Abingdon, Virginia. 
as the mayor of Abingdon, I also call upon the citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses and schools in Abingdon to recommit our community to increasing awareness and understanding of mental health, the steps that our, our citizens can take to protect their mental health, and the need for appropriate and accessible services for all people with mental health conditions. Council, what is your pleasure regarding this resolution? Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve uh, the resolution is read. Second. We have a motion and a second to approve the uh, uh, resolution as read. And uh, any further discussion about this? And I'll ask our clerk to call the roll, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphreys. Aye. Mr. Barry. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. And we thank you and, uh, you know, for bringing this to our attention. And you've really outlined, you know, the scope of the problem that we have. And I'd like to say how pleased we are to have Highlands Community Services uh, with such a significant presence in our community to thank offer you. services. Uh, the new uh, facility over on uh, Russell Road has certainly been an asset to the community. And we thank you for the leadership and the services <coughs> that your agency has provided. And it is with pleasure that we enact this resolution. Well, thank you very much, Mayor and members of council. So uh, please, I would like to make one more request, if, mm -hmm. and that would be your consideration of reading the resolution at our event this Thursday, May 9th, uh, on behalf of uh, Mental Health Month. And I'll tell you what, um, uh, if you and Ms. Rosenbaum will coordinate on uh, what time that is, I'll do my best to be there for All right. That. Thank you. And remember, you're invited to attend. All right. <laughs> thank you very much for being here tonight. Okay. And uh, let's see, I think that may be the resolutions that we've done. Uh, that brings us to unfinished business. Uh, we've had our update on the Country Club stormwater management, as well as uh, the replacement of trestle number seven on the Creeper Trail. But I see Mr. Dew's work is not finished for this evening. <laughs> He's here to give us a brief update on the Whitesmill Road Court Hill Drive project, which I know has uh, seemed like one of the labors of Hercules. I'll be glad to give you a brief update on this very one. Good, uh, <laughs> hasn't started yet, but thank you very much. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> we still have a considerable amount of work ahead of us for uh, on the easements. Um, I am uh, uh, excited to get the other three projects that we mentioned earlier tonight to bid and to award. So uh, I actually had a conversation with Kim Kingsley today, and we are going to try to renew and, and invigorate our efforts to get the, the easements out of the way. And that is. As I've said too many times now, that's uh, the, the only thing that's holding us up uh, to keep VDOT from allowing us to award that project and get started. Very good, sir. Well, I know it won't be as complicated as the Country Club States project, or at least I say that now. Uh, how many easements do we lack? We lack about 21 easements. And that's out of how many? So that's out of... Uh, that's out of like 28. We have several that are in the hands, and we were given encouraging words when we handed those over for uh, several rows. So I'm hoping that they'll come soon, uh, but we still do have some work ahead of us. Well, for all those folks that raise the question occasionally in the local press of uh, how complicated is it to, to build a sidewalk, uh, I believe you're in a position I'm here to, to tell you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. It's and that brings us uh, uh, to uh, an update on the feasibility study uh, for the, well, wait a minute, let me get organized here. Yes. Uh, an update on the Urban Pathways uh, Project. And Mr. Jackson, I've uh, been another very brief presentation. Very brief. Yeah, uh, we uh, sent out the RFP a month ago. That lasted a month. The uh, the inquiries from the different con uh, consultants. We got eight bids, or eight proposals in this past Friday, uh, from as far away as Blacksburg and Christiansburg, as close as Kingsport, and even downtown Abingdon. So uh, right. we're going to have a, a new team of uh, five people. Be the town manager, myself, uh, Mr. Dew, and I'm going to ask Kevin Worley, and then I'd like for a member of town council to sit in on that, uh, look over the proposals, and we'll um, we'll interview however many we decide as a team to, to interview. But some good proposals. Very good, sir. Any questions? Hearing none. Uh, thank you. Uh, and uh, item five was an update on the feasibility study for the conference center hotel. I would say that we are probably sufficiently updated on that one. 
Uh, moving along, uh, the, uh, the uh, saga of the, uh, uh, the West End Interceptor Project, Mr. Smith. Try to keep this brief also. I bet you can do it. <laughs> I can do it. Yeah. The underground work is complete. Just a little bit of the surface remains to be uh, straightened out and we're, we're finished. Hopefully the uh, paving of Stone Mill Road at the intersection of Hallett Drive will be completed this month and that will essentially complete, complete the project. Very good, sir. Any questions, Mr. Smith? Thank you. It's, it's good to see that one uh, wrapping up. That brings us to matters not on the uh, agenda. No, no, Ms. Ms. Eisenhower. I'd like to uh, commend my student from Virginia Highlands Legal Studies class who's been here tonight to um, make up a class and learn more about her local government. This is a Ashley Jenkins Childress who will be having her exam on Wednesday night. So. <laughs> Well, did you say because she missed a class? Also, no, is this she, punishment? She's making <laughs> extra class. I guess. Oh, extra class. Oh, class. Oh, class. Oh, class. Oh, and so oh, it's been a long winter, and she didn't see me very much. But um, <laughs> welcome her here. We welcome you, and we thank you for your patience. It's been uh, an educational <laughs> yeah, experience. So well, she deserves a purple heart this evening. Absolutely. <laughs> very good. And thank you very much. That brings us to matters not, uh, not on the agenda. I would ask, first of all, if there is anyone present this evening who wishes to bring matters to the attention of the council that's currently not on the agenda. Okay. Uh, that uh, takes us on to. Uh, Wait, uh, yes. This is the time we should talk about uh, the authorization for the town manager to negotiate. Uh, yes. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Kelly, would you care to present <laughs> that matter? It's, uh, I mean, that, that happened hours ago. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's <laughs> about mine. Mr. Mayor, members of council, if you'll recall at the work session, I uh, updated you on some property that has come available that's adjacent to uh, Colonial Road and to the historic muster grounds. Uh, that property is owned by New People's uh, Bank and could uh, be of adequate service to uh, the town of Abington for an entrance into and for parking at the mustering grounds along with the possible location of the Breckenridge cabin. Um, as such, I would, um, it was my recommendation that the council authorize me to negotiate with New People's Bank for the purchase of the property on Colonial Road, Hagee Street, and Hurt Street that is adjacent to the muster grounds, um, subject of course to a public hearing at a later date by the town council. I'll entertain a motion regarding this matter. So moved. Second. I have a motion and a second to proceed as Mr. Kelly has outlined. Uh, Ms. Any discussion? <laughs> Hearing none, Ms. Uh, Ms. Rosenbaum, if you'll call the roll, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mr. Barry. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. Okay. And uh, again, I will ask a question if there's anyone wishes to address the council regarding a matter that's not on the agenda. Okay. Uh, we have for our consideration an appointment uh, of a member of the Planning Commission to fill the, uh, the expired term of Dr. Ramsey White, who is not eligible for uh, reappointment. And, uh, Council, what is your pleasure on this matter? Uh, do, you, uh, are we, uh, do we wish to address this matter here? Do you wish to go into executive session? Uh, what is your pleasure? Is there, well, is there, is there, is there a need for expediency on this, Mr. Garrett? There's or Mr. Not, Jackson? No, there's not. The, the folks that applied, we were, the staff was asked to get them together for an interview, and we never heard from three of the four um, when asked for an interview. So they said they would get back to us with the date when they were available, and never got back to us. Do we wish to table this to the June meeting? <clears throat> I'd like to make a motion we table it to the June meeting. Second. Okay, motion to second to table to the June uh, meeting. Uh, any uh, further discussion? Uh, hearing none, Ms. Rosenbaum, please. Mr. Howard. Aye. Mr. Humphrey. Aye. Mr. Barry. Aye. Mayor Morgan. Aye. Thank you. Okay, uh, Council Member Reports. Uh, Council Member Humphreys, do you have anything you care to comment on tonight? Let's see. 
Actually, I do not have a thing, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> okay. Mr. Howard. No, not tonight. Mr. Mayor. Pass. Well, and I'll be honest with you, I'm going to pass too. And uh, <laughs> this has been a, an interesting evening, and I commend everybody uh, who was here tonight. Well, we did, and I want to commend uh, in particular the, uh, Bow the Bowserman brothers. Bowserman. Thank you. Bowserman. The Bowserman brothers. Thank you for coming. And this Chief is, Phillips for being here too. Uh, this has been, a, <laughs> I'm sure, an educational experience for you. And, uh, and Chief Sullivan, don't you mean? Uh, we thank you for coming, guys. It's, uh, uh, and I hope you found it uh, to be useful all the way. Uh, uh, sometimes it's just sort of plodding along here. But uh, we accomplish good things in this town, and it's a good place to live. And uh, we thank you for your interest, and uh, I feel that you've earned your merit badge now. Okay. Any further comments, Mr. Kelly? None further. Anybody else? Hearing none, I will declare us adjourned. Thank you.